Hi guys, today I'm talking to John Paul from Helicon. So Helicon are a Glasgow-based psychedelic band, released their second album just in the beginning of 2020, and we're just talking to John and Paul about how they've been getting on coronavirus, and just telling us a little bit more about the band. Hi guys, Cameron here, I'm with John Paul from Helicon, um, just a uh, Glasgow psychedelic band. Uh, thanks very much for being here today, John Paul. My pleasure, thanks for asking me. Cheers, thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, if you can just tell us, uh, give us a bit of background to Helicon, how you started and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, uh, man, I, I've got a funny feeling, uh, and this is that this kind of um, perfectly encapsulates the the, the disorganised chaos that this uh, this band can be. We think this might be our tenth year, but we're not really sure. <laughs> so, um, if if if, uh, if we ever had a big hit album or something like that, and people wanted to do a a potted history, um, they wouldn't get very much information out of us because we're not quite sure when we formed. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I think it's about 10 years. I think this is maybe the 10th year. Um, we're, we're, my brother Gary and I um, are the only kind of two, uh, I was going to say surviving members, but that's not true. Everybody's surviving. The only two that are still in the band from the original lineup. And uh, we've been through a few lineups since then. Um, now we're a five piece, as I said, you know, kind of neo psychedelic, whatever the, 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 the kind of the terms are that tend to be used in it. Um, we formed an East Bride just outside Glasgow. Um, a little shithole town that a lot of people know simply because the Jesus and Mary chain came from there. Um, uh, kind of the, the town next door uh, to us are, are places like Bells Hill, where you know Teenage Fan Club and all these other bands all kind of came from. So it's a little part of, of South Lancashire, just outside Glasgow, that's uh, been very um, productive um, for bands far better and more successful than us. Um, and uh, I say we've been going about ten years. We've we've had two two full length albums out now. A live session. I think we've done about eight or nine EPs across that. Um, we're now on Fuzz Club Records, um, the London based uh, London based kind of um, independent psychedelic label. I think they kind of go beyond psychedelia right enough into all that. So aye, it's been a it's, it's been a good trip, mate. Oh, cool. And um, yeah, you released the second album, sort of I guess just in time, so January last year. Um, hmm. How was that sort of, I guess, you were able to get it out, but how was it promoting it when sort of COVID and everything hit? Well, COVID kind of promoted it for us because the album was called This Can Only Lead to Chaos. Um, and as that came out, <laughs> as Brexit and COVID happened, um, they turned out to be the two absolutely perfect uh, advertising campaigns for an album that had such a prophetic title um, for, the, for the doomsday that was awaiting us all. But you're right, man. Um, we, we, we released that album, uh, as you say, I, I can't remember if it was December or January it came out. Um, and probably the hardest thing about that was not being able to tour it um, and properly promote it the way we'd liked. It was a limited edition run, so it sold out very, very quickly, um, which was good. But we had some big plans this year um, for when we were going to take that record and play it live and build on the back of it. And it really did disrupt that. But the other thing, I think there's something... You know, you can always look at what you didn't get out of it. I'm always going to try and look at what you, you, you did get out of it and how you spun it positively. And one of the things that, that I thought that, uh, that that took us to new audiences and, and maybe um, got other people to hear is um, that we would have probably had to go and tour and play live in front of was really good things like the Fuzz Club Isolation Festival that they put on um, when the Fuzz Club Festival get cancelled. So that got you into a lot of people's homes. Um, that maybe wouldn't have seen you before. And, and we also, one of the things we did right at the start of uh, when COVID lockdown happened was the, the vinyl sold out very quick. So quite often the quickest way to get new music to, to new people um, is, is through digital formats. So one of the first things we did as soon as this all happened was we just made everything pay what you want. Um, and, and I know everybody kind of did went into that, but we just felt if people are going to be locked in their house, they can't get out, we can't get it to them. People's income's been affected. How do they, you know, asking, you know, just try and give people a little bit of something. And uh, and that proved really, really um, successful for us because people were volunteering. To, some people couldn't afford that. Brilliant. We weren't doing it as a, as a gimmick. If you couldn't afford to pay for it, you did, no problem. Take it, download it, enjoy it. Um, but lots of people were volunteering money and then sharing that and giving it to other people. So we saw loads and loads of new people coming in from places like you know, Russia, China, all these kind of places that, that you'll never probably tour, you'll probably never see in the discovery. You. So there was definitely a negative impact, but we tried to turn it into something positive and, and, and get the music to as many people as we could. 
Yeah, I think even like stuff like this, I don't think I would have sort of started this um, doing interviews over Zoom if it wasn't for, I guess, lockdown and this being sort of part of everyday life, I guess. It's amazing, isn't it, man? You're exactly right. And people find confidence in things and they try things they've never done before. Um, and then these other little communities break up. And, and you know what? You know, it, it, it's, it doesn't matter if you've got a big audience or you've got a small audience. If that audience is enjoying what you're doing, it's engaging for them, and you're loving it as well, it's, it's, it's brilliant. Have you, found, have you found a lot of bands say the same thing as well? or is, how, how, have, how have they been you've been talking to? Basically just, um, yeah, there's been a lot of sort of talking about coronavirus, but everyone sort of said the same thing. Everything yeah. stopped, but there's been a lot of positives and like songwriting and stuff like that as well, yeah. So, Big time, man. Yeah, I think it's been a good time for people to sort of reflect as well from what people have been saying and just sort of, yeah, take time and... Take yeah. stock, and, and I think that's one of the... You talk about the kind of impact that COVID had on, on, on promoting a new album as it's came out just before that happened. Um, which was difficult, but what I found is, in terms of your songwriting, it was really positive because, um, you know, like most people, um, we need to do day jobs too, you know, um, and uh, so what you tended to find, and the way that we had previously worked is, you would have good ideas, you would work songs, you would maybe, we were a wee bit uh, guilty of doing this, we would kind of go into the studio, we would record them, and then we would tour them, and then you would find you were playing them different later on. Um, but what you tended to find is that you weren't spending that long honing your craft of the song, because you would get it down, you would play it, but then you'd get into rehearsing it so that you could play it live. Um, now it's kind of turned that on its head, and you can actually spend much more time, um, without doing it too long, because I get bored quite quick, <laughs> but you can spend much more time honing your craft of that song and experimenting with it and going, well, I wonder actually if we took that part away and tried this part here, what that will do to it. Whereas if you've kind of got this relentless uh, touring, gigging, recording schedule, you, you tend not to give yourself that that leeway to experiment. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, cool. Okay. And um, you mentioned the Fuzz Club Isolation Festival. How was that sort of from like a performance point of view compared to normal live gigs? <laughs> Weird. <laughs> It was it was funny. It, it, it was great though, man. I mean, we were, we are and were novices in, in home recording at that point. So you kind of, another good thing, you know, you're forced into learning how to do it. Instead of always just kind of putting it off and dabbling, all of a sudden you're dropped in, sink or swim. You need to know how to do this and do it to a good standard. So um, it was, we, we set us, we probably, I think we probably uh, bit off a bit more than some other bands and that we decided to do three brand new songs for it as well. Um, so instead of just uh, getting our heads around how do we collaborate in different environments, how do we do home recording, we decided to write three brand new tracks <laughs> and then figure out how to do them as well. So they got a wee bit stressful sometimes. Um, but I think uh, we varied it up and what we did really is, of the three songs, I performed one uh, on my own with uh, Luigi, our producer. I got him to give me a little bit of synth, send it over to me, and then I just layered everything in there, did that myself. So that was pretty easy. Um, one of them was a big, long, weird, mad, kind of vomit-inducing, um, helter-skelter uh, sitar piece that Graham did on his own. So the only track we actually had to have the whole band um, working on was Too Much Is Not Enough. Um, and that was, that, that, that was weird, but... It was it was it was good because um, Graham and uh, Mark and Seb, the the drummer and the bass player, they, um, they actually I think the song was actually written by Mark, um, the, the bass player. So he kind of had um, the basics, he had the foundations down early, you know. Um, and then it was really just a question of us taking our parts at home, adding them on, filming yourself, pulling that together, and then trying to make it look um, engaging uh, with a few effects and stuff. And one of the things that, that I was really determined to do in the Fuzz Club Isolation Festival was I had a feeling that everybody would be stripping their music down um, just because it's circumstances and, and, and resources and everybody would be doing kind of stripped down, more mellow versions of their, of their songs. So I wanted to kick it up. I wanted to do, do something 
and it was really full on heavy um, and see if you could actually do that from home and, and you could it worked uh, and I thought that gave quite a nice balance to a lot of the stuff that was going on there because we wanted to do it full Technicolor, full on, as if you were actually seeing the band live. So it was tricky, but it was a really, really quick learning process and we're benefiting from that now, doing all these new demos for, for the next set records, you know. Oh, cool. Um, and was the, so you've got the Fugs Club session, um, it's just like live session that's coming out on LP. Is that um, a separate live session or is that from the isolation? Well, that's completely separate. Yeah, that's uh, the, the, the Fuzz Club session we just did there is... Um, so after we had done the isolation festival, which we recorded in our houses, we were supposed to be going down to London to do a, a Fuzz Club session for Fuzz Club. They usually use the same studio for other sessions. And uh, obviously that was all put, paid to. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, Luigi Pasquini, who uh, was the um, recorded our second album with us um, at a studio in Glasgow, was moving into his studio, uh, the place they were working in closed down. They were moving to a new studio space in, in Partick, um, just at, uh, at, kinda by Glasgow's West End. And uh, Luigi was opening that up with uh, another guy, Harrison Reed, who's a photographer, and, uh, and Omar from the, from the Cosmic Dead, um, who, who some people might know. So those, the, the guys were making it up into a bit of a kind of multimedia studio space. So Casper from Fuzz Club said, look, you guys up for doing a, a Fuzz Club live session. And what we'll do is we'll actually film it in Glasgow at Luigi's new space, Dystopia, and then take the recording and the video from that and put them out from there. So completely different. Uh, we did include, we, we, we did a couple of brand new songs in that as well, actually. Um, I think there's about six or seven tracks, three or four are from the, the second album. Uh, and then there's a couple of brand new tracks in there. But that was, that was a good experience too. You know, it's a... I think bizarrely, I think it might it was an old uh, funeral home that the studio has this <laughs> kind of um, uh, rather morbidly, um, but it's a cracking old building. It's got a brilliant big live room with all this old brickwork and everything. So the the live sound and it's amazing. Um, and uh, and Harrison and, and Omar and the guys um, put a lot of time and effort into getting really high quality video content for that as well, which you can get on YouTube and the Fuzz Club website. So so yeah, that's a completely separate release and separate edition. And, and I think it's uh, it's probably one of the best things we've, we've done to date, I think, this, this Fuzz Club uh, live session that's out on vinyl. Oh, cool. cool. Um, and yeah, just wondering um, in, in general if you've got sort of any top moments or top moment that you have as an artist? <laughs> um, there's been a cut. I think when we did our first album, um, when we made our first album, uh, making that... Mogwai have, have, have been a huge influence. You only need to look at the name, you know what I mean? Been a huge influence on this band um, from day one and uh, and from before that. And uh, when we got to record our first album in their studio, um, that was that that was to me was was a wee moment of sitting there going, holy shit, this is for real. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and the Mogwai guys and Tony Dugan, who we recorded with, who's, who's what's a lot of their records and, and does a lot of their production, um, you know. There's, there's no egos there, there's no bollocks, there's no, they're just all very straightforward, down to earth, normal people. And, uh, and, and, and they made us really, you know, we felt at home and we enjoyed the experience there. But to me, for how much as a band Mogwai mean to me, um, to be in the place that they've made so many of their records, making your first proper full length album was, uh, was a wee pinch yourself moment, you know what I mean? Um, and other than that, there's been real, real. Some of the some of my favourite times in our band have just been the stupid things that have happened to us. You know what I mean? We spent about the first five or six or seven years thinking we had a curse um, that, that, that hung over us because there wasn't a single thing we could do that uh, that didn't uh, that didn't go wrong. Um, but but now once you kind of come through all that and you learn what you're doing along the way and you make friends with. Um, people like um, Ian Ottaway, who's Ian Ottaway, who's who kind of works with Black Label Motorcycle Club, and then they feature you on their website uh, when your records coming out. And these are the little moments when, to me, the, the, the bits that always matter the most are the things when people you really admire give you a little bit of acknowledgement that what you're doing is is worthwhile and deserves to deserves to exist. Um, are always the wee uh, are the wee ticks for me and the things I always think back on fondest. You know. Thank you very much for talking to me today. No um, pleasure, Cabby Band. And uh, you know what I'm like, I can fucking I can talk forever. So um if you ever uh, you ever need a somebody just to chat to you, <laughs> give us a shout, mate. <laughs> awesome man. Thanks very much. Take care, man.
A big thank you to John Paul for taking the time to talk to me today. You can check out all of Helicon's work, including their newest album on all streaming services. I will leave links to their work and music in the links below. But before you do that, please subscribe to our channel. We've got a lot of great interviews coming up very soon.